Well, good evening one last time. It has been a real joy to come these several days and share some things from the scientific world that, you know, frankly are not that simple and yet uh, you all have hung in there and I trust that everyone I've talked to has, has said, you know, they've learned things. That's, that's, that's terrific. Most importantly, I trust that the Lord has impressed some new understanding of his greatness upon your heart and mind. You know, I've shared a little bit about that experience I had in the seminary classroom. And uh, I came to the point of confessing that I had been tinkering with God's word and that I needed uh, just better faith to trust what his word said, that it meant what it says, but help my unbelief. One of the things that I never dreamed it would help me with was uh, an enhancement of my worship. Just having a grander vision of how great God is. You know, a lot of times the sense of creation is like God was cooking something up. Okay, the evolutionists think, put it sort of, uh, you know, too simply, of course, but all you need is water, you put in dirt, stir, and if you have enough time, you know, life will spontaneously uh, come out. Well, one of the things that I hope has come across to you is, you know, God didn't even need the help of time for his recipe to cook. It was all in his mind. He spoke these things into existence, and, and there they were. He, he's not limited like we are. He's even the creator of time, is he not? He stands outside of time. For him to look into his creation truly from one perspective is a condescension. And yet look how he condescended. He became one of us. I mean, that little boy scraped his knees, had to learn Hebrew, was made fun of by his brothers. He experienced everything that we experience. Uh, and then one thing he didn't, he did that none of us will ever have to experience, and that is have our Heavenly Father turn our is back on him because he bore our sins. How did he do that? I don't know, but the word tells me he did that, and I believe it. And I have the freedom of knowing that someday when I stand before him, I'm not going to stand before him telling him anything about me or what I have done. I'm going to say, this one, this one who is interceding for me, Jesus, he died for me. And Jesus is going to say, that's right. Then scripture believed, and uh, man, it'll all be glory from there, won't it? I hope that everyone in the room can identify with that tonight. But what am I talking about? I'm talking about, to a certain extent, the escape from judgment. Because we all deserve judgment. We're all sinners. Jesus Christ took our judgment in our place. But there is a judgment coming. And... The demonstration of the reality of that judgment, the Bible even makes it clear, it was a previous judgment on the entire earth. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the flood. So tonight we're going to consider the global flood. But many ask the questions. Bible believers uh, are not convinced. They figure, oh, you know, I don't know. Was it a global flood? That seems impossible. You know, a bunch of animals getting on a boat and then repopulating the earth. How could that possibly have taken place? So we're going to consider the, the question, was there really a global flood? Genesis chapters 6 through 9 present the story of the flood. We touched on this a little earlier. You know, creation one chapter, and then chapter 2 of Genesis is an expansion of the sixth day of creation, actually half of the sixth day of creation. If you ever hear that chapter 2 contradicts chapter 1, that is just absolutely incorrect. I'm not going to go into an explanation, but there is no contradiction there whatsoever. Genesis chapter 2 is simply more detail about what God did on the second half of day 6, which was create the masterpiece, the point of it all, creating his image bearer, human beings, man, woman. So we get this that much on all of creation. We get three and a half chapters 
on the flood. Again, when I see this kind of content, I, I figure that just the, the, the amount of information should be a clue to us that God wants us to get it. God wants us to understand it. It's important to him to tell us these things. The thing is, we've got the Hebrew account of the flood, Genesis 6 through 9, but the Hebrew account is by far not the only account of a global flood in the cultures and people groups around the world. I am not exaggerating when I say there are hundreds and hundreds of cultures and people groups that have a flood story. And one of the amazing things that they have in common, although they, they, they can be all over the place, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk about a few of them that are fascinating, is that it was a global flood. It wasn't just some local flood. It was a global flood. <clears throat> so we're going to cover a few of these uh, flood stories, shall we call them. We're going to see that they are distorted from the biblical account, but just like we were talking about how mutations multiply when you play telephone or if you are looking at mitochondrial DNA, the, the distortions of the story get multiplied as it gets passed on from one generation to another unless you've got a culture that is almost uh, <laughs> fixated on making sure that they copy these written records exactly like they were handed down, which we understand is exactly what the Jews did. The first one we'll consider is the Indian or Hindu story. Details in that, the, the, the book, the, the Hindus have a huge book of religious stories. It's called the Bhagavad Gita. And there are many, many, many stories about creation and, and the flood and, and all kinds of religious stories. And they're wild and crazy. You know, the Hindus have thousands of gods. But one of the stories in their religious writings is about a flood. It is a worldwide flood. Eight people were saved on a boat. And mankind was created again after the flood to repopulate the earth. The Karina people, where we get the name Caribbean, they um, are in the Venezuela area and throughout the Caribbean. The Karina people, their story is a worldwide flood. Eight people built a canoe <laughs> and two of each animal and all kinds of seeds were taken with them on this canoe. And then when the God asked them how did they like the new world, they go, well, it's not like it was. And so he created a new world for them. The Babylonian account, which is the most famous besides the Hebrew account. It's called the Gilgamesh epic, and there's a small story within this 12-volume epic of the exploits of a, of a warrior king named Gilgamesh who, again, I'd love to go down this rabbit trail, but we don't have time, is very likely the Nimrod that's mentioned just briefly in the Bible. Nimrod and Gilgamesh are probably the same person. In any event, Gilgamesh was looking for the person who survived this flood. He wanted to know how this person survived this worldwide flood. And the man's name was Upna Pishtim, not Noah in the Babylonian epic, but he, he finds Noah. He finds Upna Pishtims and asks them all then all these questions about how did he how did he survive? That's the origin of this this story in the Gilgamesh epic. And in the story that Upna Pishtim tells Gilgamesh, it was a worldwide flood. He was even given the dimensions of the boat. What's really humorous is the boat was a cube. Equal dimensions on all sides. Imagine that thing spinning in a flood. <laughs> you know, the dimensions of Noah's Ark. Modern ships still are built according to those dimensions because they are virtually the most stable, uh, seagoing dimensions that, that man can devise. Well, guess who uh, actually handed down the instructions to make the most seagoing, worthy vessel? You know, God gave those dimensions to Noah. In any event, it was a cube of a boat, but on the boat... Upna took two of every animal, and this is truly fascinating. As the flood receded, he used birds 
to ascertain the recession of the flood. Sound familiar? Now, of course, these are distorted from the biblical account, but these details, they just continue to mount. It's no coincidence that the details that they're coming up with were from the original actual happenings and actual record. The Casca Indians of British Columbia, in their story, it was a worldwide flood. People were saved on canoes. Before the flood, everyone spoke one language. But then after the flood, these people in canoes went to all different parts of the world, and then they began to repopulate the earth, and then they started discovering one another, and when they did, they were all speaking different languages. The Qingpas of Burma, they had a worldwide flood. Two people that survived the flood repopulated the whole earth. The Banar people of China, they had a worldwide flood. Two people floated in a chest, I don't know how that worked out, but they floated in a chest, and they took with them two of every animal. That must have been a big chest. (laughs) And how many of you have heard about the Chinese character for the word flood? You know what it is? It's eight people in a boat. You know how the Chinese characters are actually, you know, pictures. And to this day, the Chinese word for flood is a character of eight people in a boat. Not sure which language that is, whether it's uh, Mandarin or, but uh, that's the character. The Greek legend, two people were saved from a worldwide flood that killed all of mankind, and then they repopulate the earth. This is just the tip of the iceberg of the cultures and the people groups that have a flood story. And what combines, what, what they have so many of them in common is they are worldwide floods. They're not just some local local floods. I have a few other, I'm not going to go into details about these particular ones, but the Montagnes people of Hudson Bay, North America, the Harskin Indians, the Valmans of New Guinea, the Roti people in the South Pacific, the Aborigines in Victoria, Australia. And have you noticed? We've got people groups from every part of the world, Asia, Europe, South America, the South Pacific, North America, Europe, everywhere around the world, the Middle East, The world is strewn with this story, but none of these flood myths that are recorded in all these various cultures and people groups have the sensibility, the reasonability of the Hebrew account that we read in Genesis 6 through 9. As I said, a lot of people, though, even believers, they, they... They are reticent to accept this idea that it's a a global flood. What are some of the objections? Because we're going to read the Bible and it seems pretty clear. What are some of the objections? Well, a loving God wouldn't destroy the world like that. That's pretty common uh, in in circles today. You know, God is loving. He's not going to send anyone to hell. God is loving. And so many people that a lot of times will claim they don't believe in God when something terrible happens. What's one of the first things out of their mouth? How could a loving God do such a thing? Well, excuse me, sir, but you said there was no God. When something bad goes wrong, though, then now suddenly it's God's fault. Who could uh, turn a deceptive lie like that upon the population of the world well the one who hates God more than any human a loving God wouldn't destroy the world like that well let's look at a couple of verses and we'll see what the word of God says we'll let God speak for himself Genesis 6 5 then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually verse 13 Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. You see, it's not God was annoyed. You know, it was just some uh, uh, flippant thought. He couldn't stand it any longer. And it was because of what man was doing to man to clean this up. But lest we think that, well, that's the, old, you know, that's the Old Testament God. Yeah, you know, vengeful, wrathful. Let's look at uh, the text in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. New Testament 
Let, let no one deceive you with empty words. And they're out there. A loving God wouldn't do this. A loving God wouldn't do that. Huh? You've all heard it. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So the idea that God wouldn't do, uh, do that, wouldn't flood the whole earth, that is a, uh, a human opinion. And that is not what God tells us about himself. Another thing, you know, this idea of a global flood. Let's think about that. When we think about what does all flesh mean? We read Genesis 6, 13 already. Look at Genesis 6, 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. He's not even talking about just mankind. All flesh. You get the sense that, you know, God did not intend for carnivorous activity, at least to the extent where, you know, the wolf chases down the rabbit and kills it and blood squirting everywhere and he eats it. This was not God's intention for even the animal kingdom. Genesis 6, 17, And behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. Verse 19, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark. One more, chapter 7, verse 21, And all flesh that moved on the earth perished. Birds and cattle and beasts of every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. The Bible is making it as clear as possible that God intends on destroying all land life. How are you going to do that? Flooding the entire earth. And what about the rainbow covenant? You know, I know many uh, a well-meaning believer who figures, well, if we back off on this idea of a worldwide flood, because it is a little hard to get your mind around, and then we can sort of bail God out a little bit, um, you know, that'll woo someone in. That'll make somebody maybe a little more uh, ready to listen to the gospel or something like this. By the way, please do not think that I in any way, shape, or form am equating our understanding of creation or even the flood with a salvation issue. But it is a faith issue, and it can be a real stumbling block for the believer in his life and for the one who would be contemplating trusting this word. Because how about the rainbow covenant? We, we back off and we say, well, it, may, you know, it, it wasn't really a global flood. Okay, now let's read what God says about this rainbow that he produces at the end of the flood. Genesis 9, 11, And I establish my covenant with you, speaking to Noah, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all successive generations, I set my bow in the cloud. Verse 15, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. If this is a local flood, how many tens of thousands of times has God broken that promise? We just had a flood down in Florida a few months ago. Last night I pointed out, you know, you could see Katrina in the Gulf and the flood that that caused. We have floods continually. What is God saying? He will never do again what he did back in Noah's day and flood the world and destroy all flesh. Now, sometimes we think that with good intentions, we're going to sort of bail God out. Imagine speaking with the person that you're trying to lead to the Lord and, and explain some things about God's word to them. And you say, well, it probably wasn't really a global flood. And they come across this and they go, well, wait a minute. What kind of God do you have? He lies all the time. Uh, when we don't understand something or even don't like something, we must be very, very careful to handle God's word accurately and let him speak for himself. 
And if we can't answer the questions or, you know, a person is struggling with it, well, I imagine every one of us have had struggles in our life, but by God's grace, you know, we can handle the difficult things and trust him. We must allow that, our God, to do that in other people's lives as well. Another objection to this idea of uh, a global flood and then, you know, life surviving on the ark, life could not repopulate earth in such a short time. You know, you've only got this seed group of creatures on the ark. And by the way, let me mention one thing. Uh, It's not a big deal, but in the Hebrew where it says two of every kind, the Hebrew actually says two twos. So there is good reason, and a lot of Hebrew scholars actually interpret that to mean two pairs of every kind. It's not a big deal, and yet having two breeding pairs really enhances, you know, the the repopulation start, you know, after the flood when we're talking about two pairs of lions instead of one pair, whatever, something to think about. But can't repopulate the earth uh, quick enough? This is a really interesting display at the Ark down in Kentucky. If um, from Adam and Eve to the flood was uh, the calculation using the genealogy, I don't adhere to that um, specifically, but good enough, we'll use it for now. Assuming it was 1,656 years from Adam and Eve to the flood. If the regeneration of the human race was 1.1% per year, of course, it, it would have to be 100%. Early on, you know, Adam and Eve had two children. There's a 100% increase in the population, right? But, I mean, over time, it's going to spread out. If it grew by 1.1% annually, the population at the time of the flood would have been about 147 million people. If it grew by 1.2%, the population would be 758 million people. If it grew by 1.3%, it would be 39 billion people and hard to even fathom if it only grew by 1.4 percent annually there would be almost 20 billion people on the planet that's more than twice what's on earth today now there are reasons to think that maybe it didn't grow that fast as time went on especially when the lord is talking about the violence on the earth i mean they may have been wiping each other out faster than they were being born But the idea that, uh, you know, the earth couldn't be repopulated, this is in human population, animals, you know, generational span is even shorter than that. And one of the things that I used to struggle with was, yeah, but, you know, it doesn't do you any good to take two mosquitoes. Boy, don't you wish we hadn't had two mosquitoes. Well, or, or, you know, a honeybee and and a queen or something like this. All right, um, I want you to think about the, the, the practical reality of Noah and his sons and probably the town. They couldn't build that thing by themselves. They had, they had to have help building that boat, which was really basically a giant warehouse, three stories tall. And it's taking them decades to build. Do you think they're going to hire people to keep the mice out or the bugs out? or the bats from roosting up in the upper part of the roof or whatever. Folks, think about it. That ark would have been a massive floating ecosystem of all kinds of critters. You know, I don't think Noah had to take two mice on the ark. He probably took more mice on the ark than he wanted. And a honeybee, you know, how are you going to bring a honeybee on there? Well, it would have been building hives All that stuff, that ark would have been just a massive floating restart for the planet. And remember, we pointed out that uh, there is mitochondrial DNA evidence of that restart of uh, over 90% of all the animals that are on the earth. And so this idea that there wouldn't have been enough time to repopulate the earth or a good start is is, just doesn't measure up with uh, when we actually do the calculations and figure it out. Another thing, uh, not enough room on the ark. Well, that uh, for some is a is a big issue. How could you fit all all those uh, animals on the ark? Well, for one thing, 
The Bible is very clear that God created organisms according to their kind, not according to the scientific definition we call a species. And remember, we even pointed out that the scientific community can't agree upon what a species is because, you know, there's just such fine little distinctions between this little adapted uh, uh, subpopulation and that population. But a graduate student wants to get to name this thing after himself. You know, so if you can convince a committee that this should be a species, guess what? We've got a new species. God created these things according to kinds. And in those kinds, the incredible ability for the DNA to adapt to different environments is the only way anything could survive. And so what were the kinds? What we've got now are representatives of a whole bunch of species that would come from a kind. I mean, my goodness, look at Canis familiaris. You know what that is, right? There's a Canis familiaris back there by Chelsea. Um, but uh, how about the other dog that the Halliburton's own? Little, little uh, clover. <laughs> I'd love to bring Clover and, and Groot up here. Anybody that didn't know the lineage of Canis familiaris, do you don't think they would name those a different species? So Canis familiaris, was that a kind? Or were there even several of these um, different, what we call species, that were a part of the canine kind? So... We don't know how many kinds God created, but we do know that out of the kinds, all kinds of adaptive radiation is the biological term. To fit into various environments have occurred from the kinds. There's a whole field of study called baraminology, where creationists are trying to figure out, you know, genetically, if we can sort of go back and figure out what the kinds were based on the genetic comparisons of different species, you know, within what we're trying to determine were the original kinds. So for one thing, you know, God uh, didn't have to have Noah take 50 million, I don't know what the new count for a number of species, I think that's, I might be wrong, but different you know, pairs of animals on the ark. And the other thing that people uh, sort of wonder about is, but we, we brought this up, dinosaurs, how are they going to fit on the ark? Well, Noah didn't have to take granddad brontosaur. He can take a teenager. And you know, dinosaurs are a type of reptile. They grow as long as they live. So think about that. These ones that couldn't fit in the room, that creature may have been a thousand years old. Just, just kept growing, kept growing. So just the practicality of it. They didn't have to take all the species that we've identified on this ark. And the other thing is, how many of you have visited the ark? Uh, uh, look what I found in Williamston, Kentucky. And you know, it's only th about 360 miles from here. Get on I-75 and go on down. What was one of the, how, how many of you have visited the ark? I bet you, wow, this is great. So I don't, I don't want to speak for all of you, but I'll tell you, what was one of the first things that you, you reacted to? I can't believe how big this thing is. I mean, this picture just, you know, doesn't, doesn't do it. Uh, when you walk up to it and you, and you see the, you know, the ramp and, and all that, it's just, it's just humongous. And when you go inside, uh, the, there were three decks. Uh, this picture from inside, I'm looking at just one, one half of a tiny little quadrant. You, you, you can't even see how far down it goes, and it goes on behind me, having taken this picture, and there's three levels like this. My thought was, why was it so big? I mean, I mean, really, I mean, he could have taken, you know, all kinds of food and, and two of all the different kinds. No problem. Why was it so big? And it struck me, that remember what Noah was doing for those decades while they were building the boat? He was preaching, trying to tell people, judgment is coming. Get on the boat with us when it comes. I truly believe that God made that boat surely big enough to have held as many people as would have wanted to have gotten on that boat. But they didn't. Just Noah and his family. And like we said, you know, there's no way Noah and his three boys could have built that boat by themselves. They had help. Imagine being somebody that helped build that boat. And when God shut that door and the water started flowing, 
you would have been banging on that boat. Let me in. Let me in. And Noah couldn't do a thing about it. And so they're scrambling, trying to build a raft to keep alive. Well, you know what? They may have been able to survive a few days, maybe even a week or so if they took enough food. But uh, a year, a reasonable period of time, thinking of the flood rise, the flood receding, a year? Nope. Nobody survived that flood but eight people and the animals that were on that ark. Not enough room. Uh, when you go see it, you go, why is it so big? Another objection, you know, Noah couldn't build a ship able to survive the upheaval of the floodwaters. Um, I don't know how many of you watched the, uh, it was presented as a debate. It wasn't a debate uh, with uh, Bill Nye and Ken Ham a few years ago. And one of the things that just, just brought me up out of my chair was when Bill Nye was saying, my grandfather was a shipbuilder in Boston, and they can't build a boat that would survive even a, a big uh, storm on the ocean today. The idea of some ancient building a boat that could survive, you know, a, a, a for a year in a, in a flood like that is absurd. And uh, nothing, nothing was said, but uh, I, I just thought, well, wait a minute, that, that assumption is so common, you know, that we came from ape men, you know, or the old Neanderthals, old dumb brutes. Actually, the fact of the matter is they were brilliant. Guess where the, where the dumbing down is happening? It's happening to modern man. And I think we should understand that those people, as long as they lived, and the, the, they were brilliant, the technologies that they probably have, I'm not talking about computers and electric lights, but the technologies that they had would have far surpassed many of the things that we have today. I asked the question, well, what about the pyramids? Can we build the pyramids today without our cranes and all the other stuff? It's still a mystery. How in the world did those pharaohs with just a bunch of slave labor <laughs> build these pyramids? Well, because they had technologies that we don't even understand anymore. And the idea that Noah was some dumb brute and he couldn't hardly put two sticks together is just an improper assumption of the stupidity of those old guys and our brilliance. God told him the dimensions, and if there was anything that Noah needed to use to make a boat that could withstand that kind of upheaval, I'm sure God would have given him the information if Noah didn't already know it. I've already touched on this, talking about the ark being built over, over decades. But, you know, a lot of times when, when you're asked, you think about it, how long did it take Noah to build the ark? What, what's, the, what's the number that often you know, might even pop into your head? 120 years, right? 120 years. Um, I, uh, I want to give you something to think about that maybe it wasn't 120 years. That comes from the verse in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. It says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Okay, I mean, it's... A, it's it, it really does seem like, well, maybe what God is talking about, you know, that's it. I, I've started the, the stopwatch. In 120 years, I'm bringing the flood. And it, and it could be that. But if that's the case, God is speaking um, uh, to himself, and he's certainly not talking to Noah yet. Where he's talking to Noah, the first account that we get starts in verse 13 of Genesis 6. And as we read through this, we see that it, it, it fills one narrative. It, when you read it, it's one conversation that God is having with Noah. And you get the sense that this is the first time God came to Noah and told him his plan and told him what to do. So, uh, I'll just, I, I'm not going to read that whole section. But I want to point out in verse 18, it says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. So now, if this is all the first account, the first time when God comes and speaks to Noah, and he tells him the dimensions and, and all of this, when God is speaking to Noah, Noah's sons are already born, and in fact, they're even married. So, we also learn from 
another portion of uh, the Genesis account in Genesis chapter 11, verse 10, that Noah's sons were about 100 years old when the flood hit. Now, they, no, we don't think that they were triplets, but apparently he had these three sons, well, you know, boom, 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 right around 100 years before the flood. So right there, if the flood came 100 years after the boys were born, well, then that 120 years was 20 years before they were even born. And yet, what did God say? Your sons and your sons' wives. So how long before that flood came was it that God came and told Noah to start building the boat? Was it 40 years, 50 years, 60 years? I would say it's somewhere in that, in that neighborhood. That's not to bring down any, any important doctrinal point. But again, we just want to try and be accurate and think about it. Um, 50, 60 years it took them to build that boat. Um, but then that leaves us with another question. So what's that 120-year thing? Uh, it could be that God was just saying, okay, I've made this decision. Uh, in another 50 or 60 years, I'm going to go talk to Noah. It could be that. But it could be that actually what God is talking about is his intention is he's going to bring the lifespan of man down from this 900 plus years to 120. Uh, so one of the purposes behind the flood was not always, uh, only to wipe everything out with a restart, but also to bring the lifespan of humanity down. And if we've got time, I'll talk about that a little more. We'll look at, we'll look at uh, some in interesting information that relates to that. Was it a global flood? I think uh, for every reason under the sun, we should understand that God's word, and as we think through it, we should understand that indeed it was a global flood. But how did the flood happen? Well, we can just say, well, God, well, God did it. Well, that, that's okay. Uh, that, that's good enough in some senses, but you know, a lot of people want to know the dynamics of it. And uh, as a scientist, you know, uh, you, you, I think, well, it'd be interesting to see if there's evidence uh, when we take God's word and what it says and we look at the world around us to, to put some of these things together and build a, build a picture of what took place. When we think about what took place, how did God bring the flood? Genesis 7:11 is the, is the key verse. You know, we tend to think of the 40 days and 40 nights. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, that's Genesis 7, 12. But actually, the more important verse explaining the dynamics of it is Genesis 7, 11. We still got 7, 11s? Uh, right, yeah, so it's an easy verse to remember, Genesis 7, 11. So when you're trying to remember, what's that verse that sort of gets you into the heart of the flood? Genesis 7, 11, and that'll get you right into it. Let's read it. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, let's stop right there. Listen to the detail. This is talking about the date of the flood. Now, it's not February 18th, like my son one time when we were having devotions. It was February 18th. And Luke goes, oh, hey, look, it's the anniversary of the flood. And we go, what are you talking about? And he goes, February 18th. Goes, well, Luke, that's really great. But that isn't probably exactly right. It's just according to the days of Noah, keeping track of his lifetime. Anyway, the detail that we find like this throughout the narrative on the same day, all the fountains of the great, great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So we see that there were two sources of water, not just the rain. There were two sources of water for the flood. And the first one even mentioned was fountains of the deep, fountains of the great deep. And then the floodgates of the sky, the rain that we tend to associate more with the flood. So two sources of water. Uh, you know, creationists, we, we have different ideas uh, and a lot of these things because it's science, and so evidence gets interpreted differently, and there isn't enough evidence to just ironclad make the statements. And so there are different proposals out there based on the foundation of Scripture is accurate. Now let's try to fill in the gaps, although not the gap theory. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, one popular creation model is called the vapor canopy. Have you ever, how many of you have heard of the vapor canopy model? Oh, a few of you, okay. 
Well, then I, I, uh, I'll tell you a few things about it. It was proposed by Whitcomb and Morris in what I would consider to be the foundational book for the beginning of what we call the creation science discipline, movement, whatever you want to call it. That was published back in 1961. And they did a, a, a great job of, of describing and talking about this vapor canopy model. But another model that is adhered to by a lot of creationists is called the hydroplate model. Have any of you even have heard of that one? Not too many of you? Okay. Well, it's okay. So briefly, let's look at what this vapor canopy model is. And I'm using this term model because it's not from Scripture. This is ideas of people putting evidence together with the Word of God. So this isn't the Word of God. This is cre creation scientists' attempt to explain maybe what happened. I always want to make these distinctions. What the vapor canopy was, was on the second day of creation when God talks about separating the, above, the waters above the expanse from the water below the expanse. The proposal is the expanse was our atmosphere. One of the crucial steps in the creation of earth to make earth what it is, a place where life can survive. Our atmosphere is absolutely crucial for life. It's what distinguishes us from certainly every planet in our solar system or any other planet that they may think they're going to find. And that atmosphere had on top of it another body of water. Not liquid water, but water vapor. But a huge vapor canopy around the earth, sort of just uh, uh, sort of shielding it and holding, it, uh, holding the atmosphere down, really. If that were the case then we would know of at least two major effects that this vapor canopy would have had on the surface of the earth. One is that there would have been a huge greenhouse effect. And we're all familiar with the greenhouse effect, greenhouse gases. Well, you know, water is a greenhouse gas. When light shines on it, it absorbs heat and uh, warms things up, as well as carbon dioxide. The other effect would have been a protective shield. I'll explain that in a minute, but let's go back to the, the greenhouse effect. How does this work? What was going on? Well, when light shines on our atmosphere, or if, uh, well, with this big water vapor canopy around the earth, the light would cause those water molecules to vibrate. Uh, you all understand how this works? If you want to do the test, rub your hands together, and what starts happening? They start warming up. Friction matter rubbing against matter, water molecules rubbing against water molecules, produced heat. And so this would have produced heat, a nice warm blanket around the entire earth from pole to pole, not just around the equator. And evidence for that? Well, where do we find large deposits of biomass? What am I talking about? Well, the leftovers of trees and, and huge forests and things like that. Well, uh, where do we find coal and oil? Well, we find coal and oil under the sands of Saudi Arabia, deserts. No forests there, and yet there's boatloads of oil down in the ground. What does that mean? Well, once upon a time, there had to have been biomaterials there, huge forests that were, according to the creation model, collapsed during the flood, buried, compressed, and turned into coal and oil. For example, coal... Alaska has more coal than any place on the world. Well, maybe Siberia's got more. But we find all this coal where? Up where all the rainforests are, right? No, it's tundra up there, ice up there. And yet, once upon a time, they were covered with massive forests, and they were dropped, covered up, and now we're digging it back up and using those biofuels. There's other evidences of a warm earth from top to bottom, from pole to pole. The marine reptiles, mosasaurs, they're extinct now, but they were reptiles that swam in the ocean, and as, and as reptiles, they were cold-blooded. And so, uh, you know, they, they've got to warm themselves in the sun. They've got to swim in warm water. But lo and behold, we find mosasaur fossils buried on the continent of Antarctica. What does that mean? Well, once upon a time, the Antarctic Ocean was as warm as the Gulf of Mexico. Forests in northern Alaska, Gulf of Mexico type temperatures in the Antarctic Ocean, we've got evidence of this planet 
you know, worried about global warming. Well, the whole world was toasty warm with no polar ice caps once upon a time. Another thing that that vapor canopy would have produced is a protective shield around the earth. What do I mean by a protective shield? Um, if you go out in the sun without sunscreen on, what starts happening? You get burnt. And uh, if you're underwater, you know, you don't, you don't get burnt. Water stops ultraviolet light very, very quickly. The thing is, it also stops other forms of radiation. Uh, not as quickly. And there are some, form of ra- some forms of radiation that just go right, right through. But for the most part, harmful radiation, gamma, x-ray, ultraviolet light, water stops it. 11 feet of liquid water is equivalent to one foot of lead in its ability to stop radiation. Now you go, yeah, but you've made the point. It's, it's a water vapor. Well, the effect is the same, only you're going to have a, a larger volume with it being water vapor. But eventually, you know, who knows how thick that water vapor may have been. What liquid water equivalent it may have been, we don't know. But if it was even amount uh, of 11 feet of liquid water when it condensed, it would have been before the flood like as if the earth had a one foot thick shield of lead protecting it from all the harmful radiation. And yet visible light could still get through because visible light is just the right wavelength to work its way through water molecules. Vapor, not liquid. You know, eventually it stops going through liquid. So, This protective shield was lost after the flood, according to the vapor canopy model. And do we have any evidence that maybe something like that could have happened? Well, yeah. With the loss of that vapor canopy, the proposal is, and so it's like God said, okay, let the mutations begin. We've been talking about mutations, uh, how DNA that's damaged in various ways causes health problems and so on and so forth. Well, look at this. Let the mutations begin. We can remember that the Bible says, for some ridiculous idea, people live to be on average 900 years old. Adam lived to be 930. Noah, 950. 900-year-old men, hey? Yeah, this is the genealogy, the ages that are recorded for us in the Bible. Notice that they bounce around. Enoch doesn't count. Why? He didn't die. Right. So we don't know how long he would have lived. So his number gets thrown out. It'll mess up the average. When you take this and average it out, it comes to be 912. But the average isn't as important as notice there's no trend here. You know, the the ages are bouncing around, but pretty much 900 years old, right up to the flood. Now notice the lifespans of man after the flood. Shem who was born before the flood, was on the ark at 100, only lived, (laughs) that sounds funny, only lived 500 more years. There could be all kinds of reasons, but one reason might be, well, he's getting hammered by ultraviolet radiation and gamma radiation, all kinds of things that are, you know, impinging on the earth now that didn't used to hit the earth. But more importantly, you know, his genetics are being degraded, as are all people that start multiplying on the earth. And notice the trend here, the drop in human lifespan after the flood. There are a number of ways of explaining this, maybe because God said you can start eating meat, Man, I'm glad God said we can eat meat. You know, I'll, I'll take a ribeye steak and live to be 100 way before I'm going to eat just broccoli and live to be 300. Um, and those of you who are vegetarians, more power to you. But I like my red meat. And if it's killing me, so be it. Who wants to live? Uh, anyway, I'm getting off the track. Uh, so that could be part of it. You know, there are different ideas. But how about the accumulation of mutations, bringing the lifespan of man down until you get to Joseph? Man, he's eating all that rich Egyptian food. And uh, he's been accumulating mutations since Shem. And uh, he only lived to be 110. And f- for the people back in those days, you know, that was, that was not very old. Moses lived to be 120. And uh, it's fascinating that aging research 
is indicating to us that we are actually limited to that age as a maximum, even though the average is moving up. Still, the maximum, it's almost like it's pinned at around 120 years old. Fascinating research. Again, it'd be something I'd love to present, but we don't have time. Um, Here then is the demonstration of what I think God meant when he said his days shall be 120 years. God said, you know, the days of having men contrive just more wicked ways of living for 900 years is going to be curtailed. And 120 is going to be the max that I'm going to let anybody live. He brought the lifespan of man down on purpose. And what's really fascinating is there now is genetic evidence that supports the idea of the mutation accumulation on a massive scale in the human race, reducing human vitality and survivability. Again, this is not work done by creationists. This is work done in the University of Washington and uh, was done back in 2012, published in Nature, And reporting on it in Discover Magazine, the the article says, Evolution in Overdrive. Uh, Here, just a little statement from, And humans have five times as many rare gene variants as would be expected. And the research, the study showed that by comparing all these different lines and then taking those mutations back, very similar to the studies of mitochondrial DNA that we looked at on uh, Monday night, it's determined that the bulk of the mutations in all human beings can be traced back to about 5,000 years when something happened and suddenly now the mutation rate within the human race just shot up and we've been accumulating them like crazy ever since. A geneticist, a creationist named Dr. John Sanford uh, taught many years at Cornell has done projections on the rate And based on the accumulation of genetic mutation and then the effects on the vitality of the human race, his projections are, without God doing anything, the human race will be sterile in another 5,000 years. Uh, We don't need a comet. Uh, We don't need... uh, uh, We just keep going the way we're going. And... uh, that lifespan. Yes, we're increasing it, and, and we've got genetic engineering and, and all kinds of wonderful cures for cancer and everything. It's wonderful what we're able to do, but we are not going to circumvent God's plan. And I don't think that it's going to be 5,000 years either. Looks like uh, could be the next five, could be the next five. We, we don't know when he's returning, but doesn't it seem like it's, it's on the horizon? Aki attributes the rapid increase in mutations to exponential population growth. Well, yeah, according to the Bible, that's happened twice. When there were two people on the earth and then when there were three breeding couples on the earth. Twice a rapid exponential increase in human population growth. Here's the chart again. I'll move on. Notice the kind of dates he's using, going back to 4000 B.C. and projecting out to 2050. Remember what it said in Genesis 6, 3. The Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. He's flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. You know, for a lot of people, that might be a distressing thought. You mean there's, there's no hope? You know, God is the one who has intentionally brought lifespan of man down? Um, I would submit to you that is his intention. But... Uh, If we look at what he says in Romans, there is reason to have hope, but we have to place our hope in the right, (laughs) the right source. Romans 8, verses 20 through 23 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption, into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, there is a moral aspect to this, but I believe there is also a natural aspect to this, the decay, the corruption of nature. So different from this perfect world that God created back there in six days. 
And yes, it was corrupted when man sinned, but it took, you know, another gear after the flood, and it was God's intention to cause this. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, speaking to believers, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Amen? Amen. So for some, this is so hopeless. But uh, for the believer... We have the hope of eternal life. And these decaying bodies are just a vessel that we're walking around in for a few years. The results of the loss of those two effects, according to the canopy model, is the great ice age began and lifespans declined. Let me briefly explain this other model, the hydroplate model. It's a newer idea. But I think there are many, many things about it that need to be combined with the vapor canopy model to explain in especially some of the physical effects and the strata of the earth, all the, the geological layers that we see. This model proposes that when on the third day God caused the land to appear, underneath that landmass was a huge subterranean body of water. Um, how far down, we don't know, maybe, maybe 10 miles. You know, these are speculations. But a huge subterranean body of water that would have been under incredible pressure. Land sitting on it like this. Well, when God caused the flood, what was the first thing? The great fountains of the deep burst forth. And this water under super pressure. Now, as the crust split, came, comes rushing up out through these fissures, and the erosion would have been fantastic as it's eroding away, coming up through these fissures, water pressuring out. Have you ever used a power washer, you know, to, to blow mud away and stuff? Well, this would be beyond measure, that principle of eroding away the crust, turning it into all forms of silt and mud and everything, coming up from below, eroding out, and then these layers continuing to be deposited above and above and above. You know, water just coming from above wouldn't produce the kind of layering that we see. So one of the problems with the vapor canopy model all by itself was, yeah, but how did that produce the layering? I mean, we could get some, but the kind of layering that we see... Uh, the accumulation of sedimentary layers uh, above the crust are better explained by this hydroplate model of the pressurized water eroding the fissures throughout the earth and layering on top. And so we see something like the Grand Canyon. I mean, look at the layers there where the hydroplate model would explain just layer after layer being eroded from below. And we understand how this kind of layering wouldn't be the only result of the separation of the crust. As these huge chunks of the crust were being split apart, when you open up the, the crust enough, the mantle bulges up. And so with that kind of bulging that you see here behind me, the proposal is then it would literally cause these continents, these huge bodies of crust, to slide away. Now, the evolutionists um, talk about, you know, the movement of these uh, continents slamming into other plates, tectonic plates they're called, and forming the mountain ridges, the mountain ranges that we have. Of course, it's always over millions and millions of years. This proposal is this would have been happening fairly rapidly under the earth, under the protection, <laughs> sounds silly, but under the protection of the floodwaters. And so we've got this graph here of the mid, for example, the mid-Atlantic ridge, which exists today, and the continents sliding away from that mid-continental ridge. And everybody's seen these pictures of sort of fitting together a jigsaw puzzle, Africa and South America and so on and so forth. 
the hydroplate model has a, has a number of proposals, and we don't have time to go into them all, plus some of them are pretty complicated. But I would submit that what gradually is beginning to happen is, you know, it's not just the vapor canopy. It's not just the hydroplate. It's always generally, you know, a lot of different ideas synthesized together. And, and over time, you know, hopefully we're going to come up with a, with a, a model, uh, a synthesis that's going to explain most of these kinds of phenomena that we see and still, of course, be consistent, most importantly, with what the Word of God describes. And it doesn't tell us much. The fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky. But as a result, we see all around us the evidence of this global flood. Really, really quickly, one other um, example that we've learned from actual observation of where layering comes from. You all remember Mount St. Helens uh, many, many years ago. See this layer here, 25 feet thick. Uh, and then there, to give you perspective, there, there's a man standing down there. Do you know what? Once upon a time, every one of those layers would have been interpreted to be an in, uh, a distinct volcanic eruption. And so you got one layer, and then 50 years layer, year, later, you know, another eruption. Maybe a few thousand years later, another eruption, and you get this layering and layering and layering. And a column like that may be interpreted to represent hundreds of thousands of years. Well, guess what? When you actually see it happen, we find out that all those layers were produced on June 12, 1980. Uh, so it's a lot different when we assume these vast periods of time compared to when we actually watch it happen. Um, I'm not sure why we're not moving here. But uh, the, next, the next slide is, uh, shows you Step Canyon. And this canyon was eroded over a period of a few months after the volcano erupted. It dammed up a river, and then eventually, you know, it gave way, and that water came pouring out of that lake and cut Step Canyon in the summer and fall of 1980. <clears throat> like, uh, my, my computer's gone haywire. We're about done here anyway. Karen and I had a chance to visit Mount St. Helens, and... Uh, you know, there's this concern, oh, global disasters, they, they take forever to, to heal. <laughs> no, they don't. God has created this planet to heal itself actually quite quickly. Now, thank you. There's what's left of Mount St. Helens. But look at the environment around it. It is flourishing. This is, you know, less than 40 years after, after the eruption. Uh, a little closer now, when you get right close to the canyon, I mean, there are still, you know, poison gases and stuff coming out of there. It's still hot. So right around the, the, the crater, and there still is an occasional little burp, you know. So it's not growing around there, but it's continuing the, the formation of various canyons. And you know what? Life is doing very good. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, God has created this planet in such a way that... Uh, It'll, it'll take care of itself. We are responsible. We are not to go out there and trash it, but, but for us to think that we can control the weather or uh, it's all on us is a little bit of uh, hubris. We need to do our best to take care of the planet and uh, trust God to do the rest. And you know what? Global warming is coming. We're talking about big-time global warming, and it's not going to be because of your SUVs. It's going to be because God is going to judge with fire the next time, not with water. He made a promise, didn't he, way, way back, that he would never flood the earth again. But he didn't say that he wouldn't judge the world again, and it is coming. How, much is so, how can so much evidence be ignored around us? Well, first Peter, excuse me, Second Peter gives us a clue. It's because man does not want to uh, acknowledge the judgment of God. Man does not want to be accountable to his creator, Father. And so we shouldn't be surprised at the scoffing and at the denial of the flood or creation or anything else that God's word reveals. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. You know, there's never been some big judgment. You know, God's just let us go. 
For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Don't let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. I mean, we might think, what's he waiting for? Well, with him, he... It's not been very long. If it's been 6,000 years, 5,000 years since the flood, to him it's only like a, as long as we've been doing these meetings, you know? The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. How many of you know a friend, a family member, who's recently gotten saved. Aren't you glad God waited this long? How many of you have somebody that you're hoping will get saved, you know, before the Lord takes them? What a patient God we have. But he will come to the point where he will fulfill this promise and the world will be judged with fire. Are you ready for that? There's a way to be ready. And that is by having the Lord Jesus Christ pay for your sin. So for whatever reason you end up standing before God, he will be on your side and say, nope, nope. Yeah, oh, they're guilty. They're guilty. But I paid for that. And uh, when we stand before him in the glory of his presence, how will we stand? blameless with great joy imagine the leaping up oh god and and we'll find out what creation was meant to be living eternally with him and with all our brothers and sisters in a perfect perfect world the world says that's a rescue fantasy to me it makes absolutely perfect sense death and and destruction that's what doesn't make sense but that's what we're used to Lord, thank you for the hope of eternal life and the price that you paid to make it possible. We bless you. Help us be the kind of people that live with the end in mind, knowing that the time is short. And we do pray for our friends, our family members, just different ones, Lord, who we're burdened with. In your mercy, we pray that you would uh, bring them into the family. And I pray for brothers and sisters that struggle with various things, maybe trusting your word in various areas. Lord, Lord, encourage them, perhaps with some of the things that were shared this week. May they remember you are trustworthy. Your word is trustworthy. You will do as you have done everything you said you would do, including give us eternal life. We bless you and pray in Jesus' name. So, Ben. You were mentioning the other day that uh, if if all of the vegetation uh, were to be cut down, I wasn't all, proposing that, and all that stuff, yeah, that uh, life would still be able to survive. Well, no, I didn't say that. I said, but seventy percent of the photosynthesis right. on Earth would continue. Yes, yeah. that's what yeah. Uh-huh. So, so this right here is, uh, I mean, w- when the floodwaters come, uh, wouldn't that uh, wipe out all of the foliage? I mean, wouldn't yeah, it, it kill the everything that would be the green stuff on yeah, Earth? Yeah, it would have wiped out. It, it would have wiped out all the forests and, and all that stuff on Earth at the time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, all that would have to be re, re, uh, regenerated, re, yeah. replenished. Um, I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to talk to a, a nurseryman, people that really know their their stuff about dirt and plants and everything, and and. One of the comments he made was, you know, after the, the kind of dynamics that we were talking about, the erosion and the topsoil and everything that would have been deposited, he said, talk about the perfect type of soil for things to just spring, spring back. You know, I mean, the seeds and things, 
Um, Noah certainly would have taken a lot of them. One of the other proposals is there would have been mats, uh, floating huge mats of tangled debris. Some of it, uh, you know, might have float, floated through the whole flood. Some of it may have floated for a while and then sink down. And they would have been like uh, seedlings to just replant, to reroot. You know, I don't know how many different kind of plants you, you know, you just cut a clipping off and put it in. So it, it's not like, it, there wasn't any life around to reseed, right. but yeah, as you point out, um, Pastor Mike, everything would have been dropped. All That's that, the source of our coal and all of that. All that, all that blooming and stuff making my allergies act up already. <laughs> so anyway, uh, questions, questions. What do we have tonight? I'm th- uh, talking about the flood. Questions. We got one over there. Run, Johnny, run. Okay, so I've got like a threefold question. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Let me get my one pen out and I'll write them down. It, in the fifth chapter of Genesis, verse 32, it says that Noah was 500 years old and he begat Ham, Seth, and Japheth. Right. Were they triplets? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, they could have been because... Uh, the the text at, at another place, and I, I forget the verse right off the top of my head, but it speaks of actually the older and the younger, you know. But I mean, they talked about Esau being the older, right? And what was he? A couple minutes older than Jacob? So it, it could be. It very well could be that they were that they were triplets. But it also doesn't have to be that they were triplets. It may have been, you know, in around the 500 years old. But, you know, frankly, it would be simpler if we just figured they were triplets. Okay. Number two, you said that Noah took two of each. But in the seventh chapter of Genesis, it says that Noah took seven of all clean. Correct. And two of every unclean. And then seven of all the the birds. Of the birds, yeah. Isn't that so, curious? So, birds. But it says in several different places that he took two of each on the ark. So which one is it? Uh, He took two of each, and then of clean animals, he took seven. I think that one doesn't preclude the other. Okay. Of the clean animals, which is an interesting thing. I mean, we didn't have the law yet. So what was clean? Well, apparently God had revealed to them what kinds of animals he accepted as sacrifice and which ones he didn't. Um, and, And like I mentioned, there's also the possibility that it wasn't just two, it was two pairs. And so would that have been seven breeding pairs of clean animals? And I would submit yes, because remember what Noah did right after the flood? If he hadn't had seven uh, of the clean animals, well, the sheep would have been extinct right off the bat, because if he would killed one of them to sacrifice it. And and then the other thing is he immediately had animals to uh, breed, to produce milk and and clothing and, and, and things like that. So uh, the Bible doesn't make it clear. The curious thing, and I'm glad you brought it up, was that it also then said seven of the birds. And it's like, why would he single out birds? Uh, are they more likely to, you know, get, die? And, and so to make sure that the birds repopulated, you know, um, or maybe he just, Noah just couldn't keep one pair of ducks and, you know, they all just followed each other. I don't know. I don't mean to be too funny, but, um, but that's a good observation. Well, but it, I think it, there was a purpose for pre- breeding, certainly bringing seven breeding pairs of the, of the clean animals. Uh, just, a, just a joke. Be, all the birds because the birds were the dinosaurs. Right? <laughs> of course. Yeah. You know, how do we have so many dinosaurs? The birds are dinosaurs. We talked about that uh, Sunday night. The birds are dinosaurs. They're not yeah. extinct. It's and just, the last one is um, First Chronicles 119 talks about Peleg. Peleg. Oh, yeah, okay. And that the earth was divided in his day. So I was always under the, the assumption that it was one continent until the days of Peleg mm-hmm. and when the earth was divided. Yeah, that's a, that's a, 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 a good observation. And it's, it's common that maybe the days of Peleg were when Pangaea, the name for the earth having one big continent, which I would adhere to, I think, before the flood, that it probably was one big continent. Another thing we need to understand is, remember... In Genesis uh, 7, it talks about the water being above the mountaintops by some 20 feet. There's not that much water on earth, so what are we going to go? Okay, so God's creating water, and then he's decreating water and everything. No, we don't have to think that at all. 
what we should understand is the topography of the earth was nothing like it is today. If earth was a perfect sphere, would there be any land showing? No. And calculations are the ocean planet would be about a mile and a half deep of water. So you, you think about that. There would be plenty of room pre-flood for an ocean basin of a half a mile deep, mountains to be even a mile high, and there would be the water there, and we would have this topography. So when the earth crust split open, this water from below was gone. You know, the pressure, they, the ocean basins would collapse. The continents are slamming into each other and making these high, high mountain ranges. We don't have enough water on the planet to cover Mount Everest or, or even, you know, Pike's Peak. But the earth didn't look like that before. Um, the thing is, Peleg lives after the flood. Um, let me... Let me uh, read it here. It's in, it's in Chronicles. It's also in Genesis 10, the genealogy in Genesis 10. So I'm reading from Genesis 10. Um, we've got in verse 24, and Arpachshad became the father of Shelah. Shelah became the father of Eber. And two sons were born to Eber. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days, the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan had 10 sons. I wanted to name my son Joktan and Karen wouldn't have it. Anyway, because his nickname would be Jock. Well, that's a cool guy. That's a cool name for a kid, right? Anyway, I digress. So it says, for in his days, the earth was divided. I think the best way to understand what is being described there is that that, were, that was the days of the Tower of Babel. And you may go, wait, it says the earth. The word Eretz in Hebrew is a word that is used to mean people of the earth. It's used to mean, you know, the land of the earth. It's like, like a, a generic word. And very often, uh, it's obvious that Aretz is talking about the people of the earth. And so here, I think, is one of those cases where it's saying, for in his days, the people of the earth, the, the Aretz, was divided. And so you go these number of generations from Shem, and you get down to Peleg, and I think it may even have been more generations than there. I, I'm one that thinks that every father-to-son uh, relationship isn't necessarily listed. I'm not talking about adding hundreds of thousands of years in there, but it may be a little longer than just adding up father-to-son. In any event, in the days of Peleg, may very well have been the days of the Tower of Babel, and the people were divided at that time. Um, so that's, that's my explanation for, for Peleg. Steve, you get an A-plus for your questions. <clears throat> Got one there. John? Um, yep. what, what about all the people that were, or what about all of the living life that was in the sea? You know, I'm, I'm sorry, say get, that again. As I've, far as getting into the boat or being, everyone was killed, I, I thought I heard you say something about all the land creatures. What about all the fish and the whales and all that stuff? Yeah. Well, what some of them, them? Th that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, did, did Noah have uh, aquariums on the boat? No, <laughs> I don't think so. I think that what we, we should understand is, I mean, most of them were killed too. I mean, we find so many marine fossils everywhere on the tops of the highest mountains, another interesting evidence of a global flood, and then the, the uplift of the mountains. Um, but we should understand that some of them were able to simply survive. I, mean, I don't know, find nooks and crannies, find areas where um, they were able to survive the upheaval. And it's interesting, there is a much, much higher diversity of life in the oceans than on land. And that could be a product of there were a lot more than even just two pairs of any particular marine animal that was able to survive the flood. And so they would have a bigger start uh, and have then the opportunity to uh, adaptively radiate is the term, diversify, uh, even more so than the land animals. So all I can say is I think we should understand that a lot of those, li all, a lot of those creatures, uh, some of them were able to survive the flood. And God is talking, and he makes it clear, he was talking about the land creatures. He even says with the breath of life in their nostrils. So he's indicating that he's intending to wipe out all land creatures, including man, 
but he doesn't say anything about the, the, the swimming creatures. Uh, so obviously most of them were killed too, but apparently a, a number of them were able to survive. And then one, one more thing, um, from the creation to today, is that like 6,000 years or something, according to the Bible? Um, according to what the Bible says? Yeah, according, if you add up the genealogies, understanding them to be chronologies, not just genealogies, which, I, by the way, the, the Jews do not look at the genealogies as chronologies. In other words, a way to tell time. But in any event, the, the number, I, I'm really sorry, I really should know the number. I don't know it. But it's in the vicinity of 6,000 something. If you just take father to son up through Noah and then father to son from Noah all the way to, to Christ. Um, well, no, it's not. No, we don't have the, 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 the lifespans of people uh, really when we get up to David. Um, but then, you know, we sort of have an idea of what, when David lived, you know, uh, 1000 BC around in there. So, um, I can only say that the, the number is in the 6,000 something range. Answers in Genesis, um, adheres to that genealogy being a chronology. And so they've got a number. I'm sorry, I, I should be able to tell you what it is, but I, I can't. Dr. Ben, I have a question. Yeah, that was, that was uh, using mitochondrial DNA. That doesn't come out of the Bible. But that was a, um, l let me, since you brought that up, let me, let me um, just build on that really quick. That 6,500 years is based on a mutation rate, right? And, and maybe you got the sense tonight that, that I would propose that the mutation rate was almost nil before the flood. And so there could be that period of time where the mutation rate was like nothing. And so that 6,500 years might be, and, and these are all just estimates, rough estimates, but maybe that's just going back you know, pretty much to the flood. And then there was uh, more time to Eve. You know, we don't know for sure. But that number is not a biblical number. Okay, it's just an example of the time frame is pretty much what you know, we see in the Bible also. So I I'm, I'm appreciate you bringing that up. Yes. Dr. Ben, in, in the um, first chapter of, uh, first verse of chapter 6, it talks about the sons of God. Yes. And then in verse 4, it talks about the Nephilims. Can mm -hmm. you explain who they are? Yes. There are, I'll tell you who I think they are, and I'll also tell you that greater scholars and men of God uh, have a different idea. Uh, but there are plenty of, of uh, creationists and, and Bible scholars that, that have the same opinion as me. In any event, um, verse 2 is, is very controversial. It says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful. So there's a distinction between sons of God and daughters of men. Some believe that the sons of God are the same ones that uh, were, talking, were talked about in the book of Job, where the sons of God reported. You know, those were obviously angelic beings, right? The sons of God there. But there are other portions of God word, God's word where the sons of God are talking about God's people, the followers of Yahweh. And certainly in the New Testament, we're, we're called the children of God, the sons of God, right? So there's two ways of interpreting this. Are the sons of God angelic beings having children with humans? Or are they the lineage from Enosh that followed Yahweh, humans, and they started intermarrying with the worldlings. That is my interpretation. And I once upon a time did think that, well, yeah, it does seem like these are angelic beings having babies with women. Um, and then they're having giants. You know, the Nephilim are the, are the product. And it, you know, sort of makes a little sense, I guess. But then I, I just, for me, I have a real problem with the idea that angelic beings have the physical wherewithal, DNA and everything, to have babies with human women. And so to me that seems, I, you know, it could be wrong. Um, or maybe something weird is going on and they're hybrids or something. But, but uh, it seems to me that 
a better explanation than demons somehow having babies with humans is that these were the children of God. Um, the end of chapter 4. And to Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. This sets up the genealogy of chapter 5. And so you've got this lineage of people that followed Yahweh. And then we come to these people, the sons of God. I, I think these are the followers of Yahweh. And what happened? They started intermarrying with the worldlings. And what happens every time? They are corrupted. They are degraded. And look what ends up happening. For a while... There's a few generations where, you know, the, the worldlings get the advantage of godly living, you know, godly principles. We see it all the time. But after a while, that all goes away, and the degradation is extreme. So these Nephilim, the definition of the Nephilim are right here. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they were bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. The Nephilim were the, were the warriors, the mighty men. And uh, with an understanding of the principles of, of God and taking advantage of all the things the world has to offer, they took over the world. But the debauchery and the violence that ensued got to the point where, you know, what does God say? The thought and intent of their heart was only continually evil all the time. And he said, this is it. So I don't think the Nephilim had to be giants. I don't think the Nephilim were the offspring of demon-human hybrids. But like I said, many a scholar uh, do think that somehow or other that what, that's what was going on. So I, I'm not going to give you a definitive answer. I, I, I can't do that. But it seems to me that it's just another example of, you know, over and over and over again. What does God tell us? You believers, don't intermarry with the unbelievers. Here, look at the result. Israel, look at the result. And in our day and age now, look at the result. All right. But we don't get the lesson. <laughs> We're going to end with that. That was a good question in now, don't you think? That tested you, brother. It mm. tested you. Well, I, I, I can't speak for everybody, so I just, but I do want to tell what other people, because it's not my word, you know. That's right. That's right. Excellent. Well, uh, I know you've got other questions, and I'll, I would encourage you to come up afterwards and, uh, and present those to him and, you know, like, like stump the doctor, okay? That's, that's, that's what we need to do here. So they're coming for you, okay? Prepare thyself. All righty. Well, what do you think? We have finished this uh, seminar uh, session and all the rest that we've concluded here on Wednesday night with the flood. Uh, I tell you what, I've appreciated uh, Dr. Ben's scripture coming and, and presenting this. And we are all curious as, uh, as to uh, these biblical things. There are some times when we have to say, no, I don't know, and uh, that's all right, because uh, we don't. There's not a one of us that, uh, that has all these answers, uh, but it's good to know that there are those who have studied specific things, and they can come and present, and, and Dr. Ben Scripture is one of those. I appreciate him coming, and we're going to have to do this again, aren't we? We're going to have to go to, to level two next time, right? We've gotten this far. We may as well try it again, so we'll have to do that. I want to thank you. We've got a collection of people here. Some are from First Baptist. Uh, others are visiting with us here from other churches. Some of you may not go to church at all. Uh, I want to encourage you this, that it is a positive thing to get connected with Christian people. And uh, I, I tell you what, uh, you know, you're welcome. You're welcome here in this fellowship. I want to encourage you to... Um, to, to join us if you don't go anywhere else. If you go somewhere else, I'm going to encourage you to go wherever you go, okay? I don't want to take you away from that at all. But I definitely want you to know that if you're not attending somewhere and you would like to get involved, uh, I'd love to see you, okay? And, uh, and that's, that's not to grow a church. That's just simply to connect with people who are interested in like-minded things. And that's what we are here. We're we're a bunch of we're a bunch of uh, 
of, of people who are eager to find out what God says and then lead our lives with that. So uh, I encourage you to go to your church and be effective there. If you go to a church, if you don't, come here. Love to have you. Again, thank you for, thank you for being with us. And uh, we have concluded the creation seminar for this time. We'll pick it up later on. All righty. Thank you for coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we give you ourselves today. And we say, Lord, take this that you've given to us, this, this uh, life that you've given to us, and multiply our knowledge. Help us, Lord, to not just absorb it, take it in, and keep it for ourselves. But instead, Lord, to take it in and understand a little more so that we are able to explain to those who do not know you, who you are, what you, what you want in, in, in our lives, and for us to be able to explain to them your love, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, help us to, uh, to be your people who are eager to share with others. We give you ourselves tonight. Say, Lord, use us for the purpose of sharing with others your good news. We thank you, Lord, for these meetings. Thank you, Lord, for those who have come. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us life in abundance. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Take care.